Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Mark Fisher. I'm an alcoholic, um, a real alcoholic, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for asking me. And uh, it does, it, it, it is something, the relationship that I have with Stephen Todd. Uh, uh, it, it, it's three years old. I have spent a lot of hours, uh, actually there's 1,076 meetings of men who trudge. A lot of time I've spent face-to-face, uh, -face, as it were, in a virtual world with uh, Stephen. I've talked to him outside the meeting. Uh, I feel as though I know him well. We're deep friends. I love the man. He's helped me a lot. He's, I seek his counsel and advice. I, I trust his wisdom. And yet I've never, uh, I've never seen him. I've never been in person with him. I never shook his hand. So it's a strange world we live in. But uh, at another level, I think that defines the spiritual connection that this fellowship has. It transcends uh, physical boundaries and it binds us tightly together even when we're not close together physically. Um, I didn't know that about AA before I got here. Uh, didn't really know that was possible with any uh, connections uh, between human beings. Um, but I do believe that now. I do believe there is a, a deep and abiding connection. It's, it's based in love and it's part of the fellowship capital F that I have found here. And, I, you know, I have it uh, <laughs> with so many men uh, that uh, I'm amazed because I'm, I'm a guy who had a lot of problems with personal relationships uh, before I got here. Um, I got here in uh, 1997 and um, took a few years to get fully acclimated. Took a little while even to admit that I was an alcoholic. You all came to me when I was in what they call a rehab, um, first of three that I attended um, in the three years before I became adjusted enough to be uh, uh, content here and only stay in AA for my recovery efforts. Um, but there were some outside conditions that uh, I went through uh, before I got sober for the last time. Once and for all, I was... Um, I was uh, almost four, I was 40 years old at the time, and uh, that's some time ago. So uh, it been a lot of water since then, and a lot has happened in my recovery uh, that is just amazing when I think of where I was when I got here. I was in a lot of trouble when I got here. I was in trouble with the law. I was in trouble with, uh, with my wife. I was in trouble with uh, my profession. Uh, I was in trouble financially, deeply in debt. And I didn't think there was ever going to be a way out. But uh, I've not only found a way out of those problems, but I found a, a life that is more worthwhile, more rich, more truly blessed, and uh, an abiding feeling that I'm loved and lovable uh, here in AA than I could have imagined. Uh, so if that's what Bill Wilson refers to as the fourth dimension, that's what I have found. And I tell you a little bit about that. I'm supposed to tell you about uh, how it was, what happened, and how it is now. A uh, different part of the of our book says that um, uh, we're to uh, talk about my own point of view, the way I established my relationship with God, and what has actually happened in my life. So, um, I'm from Buffalo. I was born uh, in 1954, uh, uh, an Easter Sunday. Um, I had uh, two parents when I was born, but that uh, was quickly split up, and I grew up uh, with a single mom. Uh, my dad uh, took off and uh, found a new, founded a new family um, that I really didn't quite feel like I was part of. So I was an only child in with my single mom, and I had a dog. Um, it was a constant companion. And, um, you know, I, I spent most of my early years... Um, trying to make my mom's life better. At least that's what I thought. I tried to help her out, but I was prone to getting into trouble and prone to doing things that had her getting angry with me um, from the get-go. Uh, I learned some of the things that would follow me the rest of my life uh, at a very early age. Things like uh, uh, 
If you're going to get in trouble, don't admit it. Uh, if you've done something wrong, don't get caught. Um, you know, uh, they, they, those are the kind of things that uh, I took away from life. My mom took me to church, um, introduced me to a way of living that was proper, wanted me to grow up well, taught me well, um, was fairly strict in what her uh, rules were, and uh, I just rebelled against that. Um, she wanted more for me. She wanted the best for me. And um, I didn't much appreciate that growing up when it stood in the way of what I wanted to do. But I can see that now. Um, my mom has become a better mother as I've come to AA and gotten further into my sobriety. And uh, I owe that to an improved perception, uh, which has come about as a result of working the steps of the program. Uh, we have this program that has been presented to me, which has uh, a combination of self-examination, uh, meditation, and prayer. And while it took a while for me to get going at that, that has produced wonderful results for me. Um, without that, my life was led pretty much on uh, self-propulsion, self-centered. Um, went through school, did pretty well, at least uh, in the things that I focused on that I like doing, and gradually uh, my life became contracted to doing only the things that I wanted to do. And uh, I guess sort of, uh, I did well at those things. Um, I, I, I didn't start up drinking until um, my teen years. And um, uh, when I started that, it was, well, it, it was just a, an amazing experience. The first drink was, uh, always gave me a warm feeling that kind of trickled down through me. And, um, and I love that. I didn't get that again in succeeding drinks. And the basic problem that I have is that I drink too much too fast. So um, from the get-go, I've had a problem with drinking. And um, it didn't uh, quite overtake me in my teen years. Uh, I was episodic then, mostly weekends. I'd get in trouble. I'd uh, promise never to do that again. No, no, no. And, um, you know, first time I went drinking uh, it was with Boone's Farm. I promised I'd never, and I did. I never went back to Boone's Farm, Strawberry Hill. I tried something else. And uh, but gradually, I uh, just kept on drinking. And by college, I was, uh, I was a fairly regular drinker. And um, I, in college, I uh, studied biology and biochemistry and did fairly well until I joined a fraternity house and uh, was made the social chairman and felt that uh, my responsibility to <clears throat> improve the drinking environment of my fraternity house. I installed a keg in a refrigerator. We had, we had beer on tap. Um, we, we had a, a social fund that uh, raised a lot of money and um, was spent on drinking. And uh, I think I was personally responsible for lowering the house cum. Um, but <clears throat> uh, drinking caught up to me in college. Uh, I actually got physically ill. Uh, I uh, started, I got a bleeding ulcer, I was hospitalized and, and told, uh, you know, stop drinking. That was the first time I got a medical warning about it. Um, I stopped drinking straight alcohol. I went to that Bailey's Irish cream, you know, started to moderate. Uh, I learned that it would be better for me if I mixed some drugs with my drinking. So I picked up uh, smoking at the time. And, um, and somehow I, I learned not you know, I learned to control my drinking, you know, and um, and I did manage to not get so sick uh, again from from drinking so much so fast. So uh, I, I I patted myself on the back for a job well done. I thought I I had things under control. Finished college, uh, went to came home, uh, I'd been away from Buffalo. But I came home back to Buffalo. I uh, entered grad school. I was going to go to a professional school, but I wasn't quite ready. And uh, so I entered grad school and uh, um, 
between the alcohol and marijuana and the other things I was doing, uh, grad school turned into a very long uh, period of uh, time out. <clears throat> um, I uh, got married uh, in grad school, uh, went on to have three daughters, and um, uh, I did what you call an ABD, which is all but dissertation. And I uh, spent about eight years in graduate school, got a master's degree, and um, had enough trouble uh, along the way, but nothing that would change my ways. Um, my drinking was, as I said, somewhat controlled. Um, it, it's the it's same thing I found out. If you ask a normal person, can you control your drinking? They haven't a clue how to answer that. But I can tell you the 10 different ways to prove to you that I was controlling my drinking throughout grad school. <clears throat> um, at any rate, uh, I was uh, mid-20s, late-20s, and I decided to uh, go to medical school. And um, with family in hand, uh, with uh, not a lot of money, but I uh, had a job that I was working, so I went uh, uh, to medical school in Buffalo um, and was able to not drink for four years of medical school. Um, did pretty well uh, with uh, that um, I was still smoking marijuana, uh, but it wasn't getting, uh, that, that for some reason, I, uh, I was able to hold that in check and um, uh, graduated uh, pretty well. I, I, I got out of medical school. I was in a, in a fraternity then. It was a, um, the motto was worthy to serve the suffering. And I thought that uh, that would be uh, suitable for me. I was going to you know, do great things. And um, unfortunately, during my residency, I uh, went back to drinking and found some other uh, drugs that were uh, <clears throat> available to me and uh, got in even more trouble. And uh, things started to get uh, really sidetracked uh, uh, in my residency. Um, I, I got out of residency, uh, went to my first job and um, wasn't able to pass through a probationary period. So uh, there I was with a wife and uh, three kids and um, had no job and uh, questionable uh, being able to have a career. And uh, my wife was saying to me, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And my motto, like my mantra, don't worry, I can handle it. Um, oblivious to the life I was leading the harms I was inflicting upon people, um, the, the gifts I was wasting, and um, in a boatload of trouble that I couldn't really see. Um, in the next three years, as I said, I, I did go to uh, uh, rehab, went to uh, a couple of programs to help me get back on my feet to uh, begin to admit where I was, but it wasn't until I firmly landed in AA with the sponsor I have um, and were surrounded by the men in a fellowship program that I was able to really see um, who and what I was. The devastating truth uh, that I had just been denial. I was, I was in complete denial. I, I've learned that, that that means for me, don't even notice I am lying. And um, the life that I had uh, been leading was... Uh, it had some good points. Um, I certainly had a loving family, but it had a lot of stuff wrong with me. I was creating, I was manufacturing my own misery. And I didn't seem to be able to stop it. I was making all kinds of promises to people, um, and I didn't seem to be able to fulfill those promises. And um, I lacked the power. Um, I lacked the willingness to turn my life completely over to the care of a loving God. Um, I thought that I had reached a desperate point several times and um, made sincere promises several times. And uh, they were all short-lived. And each time I would, uh, you know, make a new even more potent, more strong resolution that um, 
well, I think for my wife became uh, weaker and weaker. Um, um, it really took the grace of God for my life to be saved and reclaimed from the pile uh, and the choices and bad decisions that I was making um, while living an alcoholic life. Um, I had to stop using all the things that affect the way I think or feel. Um, and I did that only by the grace of God and with the help of a fellowship that uh, literally supplanted that. Uh, when I finally started to get sober, I was going to three, four or five meetings a day. I was spending my time with uh, becoming like addicted to AA. I was spending my time completely in this fellowship. That's what it took for me to get away from a lifestyle that was deviant and um, disastrous. Um, it took a while for my brain to heal from all the stuff I had put into it. Uh, I was, uh, uh, I reached my first year uh, of being uh, clean from everything um, and was, it, <laughs> Well, I, I remember it well because I read a page out of the big book and I turned it and I was able to recall what it said on the page that I just turned. Um, yeah. So it took a while for me to detoxify, but um, my sponsor was a very patient man. Um, he stayed with me um, through a lot of torture, through a lot of... Uh, doubt and uh, self-pity um, and self-hate in those days. Um, AA had uh, welcomed me in, but I didn't think they were sincere. I didn't think they knew what they were getting. Um, but he made it clear that they did. He embodied your slogan of reaching out the hand and being loving and tolerant. And uh, he saved my life. And I found that uh, here that continues to be true of the other men that I found in this fellowship. They have a way of not only lifting me out of the doldrums when I head that way, spotting it before I can see it, um, but helping me see a new way to head uh, by disclosing to me who they are and what problems they face. And invariably, I have this aha come over me that that's me too. You know, somebody was talking about um, having fights with their family. Well, yeah, I got into fights with my family. Well, I made the fights happen so that I could go out and do the things I wanted. Well, I didn't see it that way until it was described to me in AA by a man who was talking about himself. And I was able to say that through that, yeah, that's exactly what I did. I manufactured the misery. I made the fight. I instigated the stuff so that they would push me away, ask me to leave, go, and then I could be free to go and do my thing. I was able to see the truth about how I had been living in AA in hindsight because of the men who shared their stories with me. And um, with that, I was able to come to grips with who I really was and how much I needed forgiveness. The strange thing, they showed me love that allowed me to see the truth about me and allowed me to learn to love myself. And in doing that, I learned to be completely tolerant and forgiving of others. I learned to be able to love others. I mean, it not only reclaimed my life, it gave me a whole new way of looking at my interior world. I thought myself the victim. I felt myself ostracized. I felt myself, you know, going to do it my way, independent. And um, that's not how I see life these days. I've learned a new way of viewing life. Um, kind of like a new pair of glasses uh, where... Thanks to AA and this program, I've learned that what I really need is forgiveness, mercy, kindness. And the best way that I know to acquire that, what I've learned here, is that I give it away. I lead a life where I have the ability to be merciful, to be kind, 
to be non-judgmental, to be tolerant of others. Um, and what I thought was a burden uh, going through life, uh, saying, oh, that's okay, is now a, a pleasure. It, I, it's now, it's just delightful. I, I don't know, I, you know, without the, the deliberate manufacture of life, my life has gotten a lot easier and, and more richly blessed. Um, and it turned out, uh, you can probably imagine, I was in a host of trouble when I got here. And uh, shortly after finally sobering up and getting back on the right track, um, I'd been in AA for a few years. The state uh, uh, was going to allow me to continue to practice medicine, but they, um, they had uh, a differing opinion at it at the upper level. And, and there was a hearing about um, whether or not I'd be allowed to get back to medicine and have, keep my license. Um, I remember being um, called to Albany, that's our state capital here in New York, uh, to meet before them. And um, I was going to face a, uh, a lawyer who took on the role of a prosecutor. And his role was to um, present the case against me. I admitted the things that he was going to present. I admitted that I was uh, an alcoholic and I used drugs, that I was impaired. But I, um, I said that I had amended that way and wanted to get back to work. And um, anyway, the hearing took place in, uh, in the year 2000. And um, I didn't know it, but I was uh, very fearful of it. I went through a sort of mock hearing and questions that were given to me. Um, I faced, I thought, right up. Uh, honestly and uh, straight on. But what I was doing was I was defending myself. I was making excuses. I was giving rationalizations. And a gentleman who was there with me said, if you do that at the hearing, you're going to hang. I didn't know what to do. That, that was my way of living, making excuses, building up uh, the story as to what happened and, and why you know, I was the victim. Um, I had become masterful. It was you know, lies and confabulations, but uh, that was how I lived. And um, faced with the reality of, of maybe just speaking the truth, I didn't know how to do that. Um, but I'd been in AA long enough that uh, I knew, I learned how to tap into this power we have here. And I've learned that this power we have here is love. And so um, for a week before that hearing and before I went to face that prosecutor, I asked God to help me love Anthony Benigno. Um, the mantra, instead of I can handle it, turned into help me love Anthony. And I went, and um, I don't honestly remember what happened during the hearing. I know that I admitted the things that I had done wrong. I admitted to it all. I apparently didn't uh, spend a lot of time uh, explaining and rationalizing. Um, but I remember myself remaining attached to this power and asking for the love. And the result of that hearing was that I was given probation and allowed to continue to practice medicine. I, uh, I haven't gone back to using anything uh, and I passed through the probation and I've allowed to, been allowed to practice in New York State ever since then, thanks to the love of God that flowed through me during that hearing. That was one of many spiritual experiences I've had with the power, the loving force of God. Um, I can see now more clearly through my life where God has been with me uh, at times that I wasn't uh, keenly aware of. Uh, if you're familiar with that poem, Sands and the Footprints in the Sand, I mean, clear he was walking with me and carried me sometimes. I 
chose not to see it. I made decisions along the way to go and drink, to do my thing, to follow my desires, which were quite opposed to the way that my mom brought me up, quite opposed to some of the things that I had done early on. Um, and they weren't necessarily fueled by alcohol. They were fueled by selfishness and greed and gluttony. And um, I, I know them now for what they are, and I know them now to be able to avoid them. And I don't fuel them or throw any more alcohol into that fire because uh, I, I want the life that I have now. And uh, the life that I have now is, uh, is one where I'm trying to be gentle and kind to everyone that I meet and uh, to take a kindly and tolerant view of them despite their differing opinions or their shortcomings and to treat them with respect. It says that those, those are the keynotes that we can come into harmony with practically anyone. And I, I can testify that that is true. I, I practice addiction medicine. And um, so some of the people that uh, I get a chance to uh, help are people not, not unlike myself or in the grip of, uh, of a disease. And um, because of this program and this new way of life and having a God present in me, uh, I have an ability to uh, offer them a, uh, a hope that was offered to me when I didn't even know that that's what I needed. You know, I was looking for a break. I was looking for a way out. I was looking to get the heat off. I was looking for, you know, a, a reason that they wouldn't put me in jail. And um, what I got was so much more. And I love the life of being able to transmit that with God's help in a loving way to people who may want it or may not. Um, I, what I get to do is to carry the message. Uh, God gets to do what he will with them. Um, sometimes it, uh, it happens years later. Sometimes I find out and sometimes I don't. But um, I, I'm okay being a messenger today. You know, I, I've been doing, I, I do step work every year. I go through the steps. And uh, this week I've been doing the, uh, the bedevilments and, uh, and looking at myself through that mirror, through that uh, hourglass and you know as I mentioned to you at the uh, beginning uh, I had so many personal problems uh, so many times where I was uh, picking fights where I was uh, cruel and harsh with people where I was you know just the person who pushed people away or the person who you know, took people hostage and, and used them um, you know girlfriends along the way or or, you know, I, I just didn't have a, a good idea of what it was to be a true friend, to be someone who could be counted on, to be someone who could be loyal. Um, but AA has given me a set of principles to live by. And without the drinks, with the fellowship of people who can call me on my stuff uh, that I can be accountable to, I have the guidelines and the the sort of rails to lead me down the tracks to a life that is so much richer than the life that I've led. And I, I've found in doing the ninth step work that uh, I've been able to go back and mend almost all of those personal relationships. Um, so I have a, I have a host of friends. There's nobody that I walk down the street that I'm uh, worried about seeing uh, anymore um, because I've, I've learned to control with the help of God and the fellowship, my emotional nature. Um, I, was, I was not able to do that. I was, I was, you know, whether I was in the midst of a craving or a desire, uh, you know, it, 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 was, it was never good. I would go to lunch and have just a, a drink or two, and, and I'd walk away thinking, oh, I've, I've handled it. I'm, I'm good because I only had two drinks. I didn't go too far. And then I'd spend the rest of the afternoon sort of 
low level pissed off that I couldn't have more and not being able to wait until I could get back and have more. And needless to say, the people who were in my way through the rest of the afternoon, they suffered. They suffered because of my irritability, my short temper, my inability to be patient. I don't live like that anymore. Um, my emotional nature without the alcohol and the drug and the cravings and the withdrawal and all that stuff uh, that went with it, my emotional nature is more stable, more balanced. And I have prayers that, you, that I use through the day that help me keep on that level plane. So uh, I pray to God. I am not a prey to misery any longer. I don't manufacture misery and I don't have that uh, to face uh, any longer. Um, uh, when I when I told I told you that when I got here, uh, my career was in jeopardy. I, I was not able to do the life and uh, live, make the living that I had trained for. But uh, now I can. And uh, along the way, I've I followed in some keen advice from my uh, my sponsor who uh, uh, did work to uh, help others in his profession. So I've, I've also had the opportunity to work as an organization called the International Doctors of AA. And um, I've been able to, to do uh, work with them and uh, volunteer my uh, time with them. Actually got deeply involved with them to the point where in 2006, I joined uh, an executive committee. And in 2010, they, I, host, I helped host a a big convention here in Buffalo, there's uh, a thousand uh, folks at that convention. And we raise money for the organization, does outreach to help other doctors who are in trouble. So I've given something back to the profession that I um, was on the road to tarnishing, you know, irreparably. Um, but AA and God intervened early on in my career and I was spared and now I've been able to um, have a role in helping other uh, doctors who are having problems with alcohol uh, face up to their reality and, and come into the life that I have here. I carry the message to those folks um, with a great deal of love and tolerance because I know what that's like. And, um, you know, it's like... God has allowed me to come through these troubles to, to equip me to be able to speak to folks who are in the trouble that I was in. And that's almost magical how that happened. The very things that I was ashamed of, um, felt guilty about, are the very things that are now beneficial to me in an arsenal of tools that I can use to help someone else. That's not possible in my hands. That required divine intervention to get to. And, um, and, and that's what I found in following this program uh, as part of a life that is vastly worth living. Um, so along comes this pandemic and uh, everything changes. Uh, and my sponsor was the one who suggested, well, why don't you start a meeting on Zoom? And with his help and a couple other key players, um, started this little tradition out of Buffalo called Men Who Trudge. And I've been able to now meet so many other men um, in a virtual world. Uh, men that need, uh, you know, uh, someone to talk to, men that are looking to get sober, men who have sober and have things to give me. Uh, there's a there's a, a selection of about 35 men on that meeting every morning that have way more than I do. And I look to them for a power of example, uh, for insight into how I think, and I don't understand how I think, but when I hear them talk about it, I get this aha that goes on. Oh yeah, I do that too. It's it's, it's, it's amazing how that works. Um, I, I, I can't admit it to myself. I wouldn't admit it to myself. I deny it. And then one of these guys says that that's what's going on with him. And I'm like, 
Yeah, I do that too. I mean, it is the perfect plan for someone as pig-headed and defiant as me. It's the only way in. It's the only way in. I, 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 I have a hard time with authority. I've always had a hard time with authority. I, I don't know if that's because my dad left when I was young or, or whatever, but, um, you know, taking the direct frontal approach here, do this, you must do this, meets with no, no, I ain't gonna, no. No, I'm going to find a better way. I'm going to find a different way. I'm still prone to being that like that. I'm just, you know, I'm, in some ways, I'm too smart for my own good. I'll say no. I'm going to do that. You know, but AA has a way of getting behind that wall that I put up of defiance and and showing me who I really am. And without that information, I wouldn't be able to grow here spiritually as i've done i'd be stuck i i absolutely need this fellowship uh, not only for the maintenance because i'd be alone here without but for the growth of my spiritual condition and 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 that's how it works i mean one of those bedevilments is that i was unhappy i'm happy now there's any number of people that I can talk to and, and call and, and share uh, sweet memories, listen to their stories and be delighted. Uh, just, I, I don't know, it's been, it's, it's like I've been touched with a, um, with a knowledge that life is so much brighter and richer than I thought it was. It, 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 it had gotten very dark for me. Near the end, I, you know, as it says in our book, I, I, I was hanging out in sordid places, partly because those are the only places that would accept me, and partly because I wanted to feel a little bit superior, and I needed to go find something quite, quite down the road, uh, inferior, in order to ha capture a glimpse of that. Um, but I also found understanding there. You know, the poor me's wanted somebody else to sing that song. And so I hung out in sordid places and I don't do that anymore. I don't need to do that anymore. I hang out in AA rooms. There's a mix there. There's some sordid and there's some, wow, I wish I was there. Don't get me wrong. I, I value, I need the people who bring back the view of how I was when I got here. The, oh, thank God I'm not there anymore. Can I help you? I need that guy to be there for me so that I can keep it real, keep it new, keep it fresh. Um, I, I, I have a forgetter that works too good exclusively on the pain in my life and I'll, I'll forget. So I need those guys around and I need the other guys too for the reasons that I was just talking about. Um, they, they allow me to have a life that is just richly blessed. Um, I, I had a point in my life where uh, when I got here, I was barely willing to, to come. It took me a while to admit that I was an alcoholic like you, and uh, I wasn't feeling too useful. And uh, today, that is not true. Today, I... Um, I have the feeling of being useful. Um, I seek to grow that feeling. Um, and uh, it's fostered and, and there's fertile ground for growing it here in AA. Uh, my deepest desire is to be a trusted servant, which is the title I earned when I was in IDAA. I got a raise to, went to the top of that uh, thing in the executive committee and was able to host a meeting and they gave me a gavel. It's right here on my desk that says trusted servant on it. And that, that's all I want. That's all I want to be able to serve, to be that channel that God can bring his love to another man that I'm trying to bring hope to and God can work his miracle as he worked it on me and um, reclaim a life that's always worth saving. It's just always worth it. It is never too late to make the right decision and turn things around.
Uh, I'm proof of that. Uh, you know, I was I was hanging on by a thread, and um, felt that way even during my probation. Um, felt that way a number of times, and God has proven that that thread is strong enough for Him to hold on to me. And if I just it says in our book, follow the dictates uh, of a higher power. It, it sounds language a little bit harsh, but what they mean is go along with the program. <laughs> I will presently find myself in a new and wonderful life. And that's where I found myself. Um, I, have a, I have a new and a wonderful life. Uh, I got divorced shortly after coming into AA, my wife of uh, many years and was, had had enough of me. Um, but by the grace of God, I was able to continue working in a profession that allowed me to uh, uh, fund my children and, and her uh, in the life that they uh, uh, needed and desired, and um, and I, I reclaimed a relationship that is not what we had when we were married, but it's uh, we're deep friends, uh, very close friends, and I have three daughters that uh, I love. They adore me. They they're musicians. They play music. So uh, I've graduated from being a roadie uh, along the way to uh, being able to sit. Uh, uh, in tickets that were uh, left for me uh, on call and uh, listen to them play. And um, I'm blessed whenever I do that. Uh, my wife, uh, my ex-wife is uh, uh, attending. I'm frequently sitting next to her. And uh, we share the blessing that God brought into the world through us. Um, so I... I I've gotten much more than I deserve. Uh, I've gotten fully forgiven by people that uh, I offended, that I harmed, that I've uh, done wrong and uh, made amends. And they uh, are in my life and uh, we have uh, great relationships today. And I'm, I'm blessed because that didn't have to go that way, I know. But God, you know, worked so many miracles and is still doing that today. Um, I, I do have some problems in my life, some physical problems, but uh, there's things that, uh, that keep me going. Uh, so I'm able to continue doing what I do and uh, able to come here and speak with you tonight. It's just been a thrill for me to tell you about uh, what AA is. I know well that so many of you are uh, nodding. Uh, yeah, that's how it is. But if uh, any of you are, are new, uh, or wondering whether this is a thing that um, is worth letting go completely about, let me just reinforce the fact that uh, for the first few years, I didn't. I, I had this, this conception of AA being like another course that I was going to take, learn what I had to do uh, to get a good grade and pass. And um, not being willing to let go absolutely what I got was nil. Uh, what I got was continue to stay sick, continue to stay self-centered, continue to stay selfish. And it was only when I let go absolutely that I learned the value of service, the value of loving and serving other people. You know, I, I was I was headed for a profession, and in that profession that. Um, well, ostensibly says I, I was there to help you, but that's not, you know, it was it was what it was in there for me. I was there for the recognition, for the, for the esteem, for the payback. It was always some payback, and if it wasn't a payback, I was I was keeping track and counting, so that I could you know claim that payback later, you know the after all I've done for you, and then list it. That was the life that I led, and. That's nothing like the generosity um, and love that I was shown here. What I've learned is a kind of gift that in giving it away, I get more. It's altruism that we have here. And I just wasn't familiar with it in my life. I had conditional love maybe, I, I, don't, I don't know. My love wasn't defined in the same terms that I've come to define it now in AA. Um, 
service gladly rendered. That's how I see it. That's how the men in my life uh, and women uh, have shown me all along. I, I, I had blinders on it. I couldn't see it. But uh, those who've helped me uh, carrying God's will to me like angels, they were giving me service uh, gladly. And um, that's what I want to do now uh, is turn around and pay it forward. I'm very glad that Stephen asked me to speak tonight. I uh, hope I've carried a message that uh, is accurate about um, how much God has done in my life. Uh, a testimony to you all that um, I uh, had a life that was going directly off the rails. A couple times I had uh, opportunities with interventions that were afforded me uh, that I could have made the right decision, and I didn't. Uh, I had to ride the train until uh, almost the end and um, then make a decision to abandon myself utterly to God. And uh, since doing that, I've just had wonderful things happen to me. <laughs> wonderful things happen to me. I, you know, I, I wonder why I couldn't have gotten on this train much earlier in life, but I didn't. Uh, and at the point at which I got on it, now I, I look back and I'm glad that I did. There's a fellow here who says, I, I almost missed this thing. And I think that, sadly but truthfully, that might have been true for me. Um, there were health, legal, financial, there was a host of issues that had come to the almost break it point when I made it here. And I wasn't even willing to admit it. I can handle it? No, I couldn't. That stands to be an epitaph on my tombstone if I go back there. Um, and I much prefer the foundation stone that we have here of helping others. It's what I'll choose. It's um, what I testify is uh, my goal. And um, what I want to thank you for uh, letting me carry that message to you tonight. Thank you, Stephen, for allowing me to come here. Thank you all for listening to me tonight. It's been a great privilege. And uh, all of you in AA, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for my life.